Welcome to Security Weekly's Virtual Hacker Summer Camp 2020. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Joining me for this interview segment, one of my favorite topics is Ala Valente. She is an analyst at Forrester Research, focused on uh, security and risk. Ala, welcome. Thanks, Matt. Great to be here. I always wanted to go to Hacker Summer Camp. Well, here we are. We're just doing it virtually this year because we couldn't be in Vegas and hanging out with all of our friends, so we're trying to do it online. That's great. This is one of my favorite topics. Uh, I, I'll set this up a little bit. I got into compliance because of third-party risk management. It, I was a security guy doing security consulting and moved over uh, to run the third-party vendor management program at National City Bank in Cleveland. Uh, and that's how I got into compliance. It's, it's why I built Control Path, my GRC product back in the day. So I, I always have a great affection for this topic. Uh, and you've been doing some research in this space. You've got GRC experience as well. I think you were at RSAM right around the same time I was at Control Path. We kind of competed with each other there for a while. <laughs> um, it, you know, what's interesting to me is third-party risk management's been one of those big challenges for organizations. And I'm curious, are things getting better or are they kind of staying the same? You know, I think that's an interesting question. Um, things are getting better, but... A lot of the risks are uh, growing and evolving, and there's more of them. I think one of the biggest challenges right now is that companies have so many more third-party relationships than they ever did. And so that just compounds their ability to really understand who their third parties are, how, uh, what risk challenges they face, and what they need to do about it. Yeah, when I was at National City, I had 70,000 vendors. It was a decentralized procurement uh, back then. And so any business unit could do pretty much any contract that they wanted. And when we started to dig into this thing, we're like 70,000 vendors. Holy cow, how do you manage 70,000 vendors and understand risk? And, you know, that was in the really early days. I mean, this is back in 2003, 2004 uh, as part of Graham Leach Bliley. And, you know, I just see the expansion of third parties growing, and it's not just third party relationships. I think what really gets interesting is when we think about fourth, fifth, X uh, party relationships, because our outsourcers are outsourcing. So how do we understand risk, not only of our immediate, because we have a contract with the third party, but then they have contracts on contracts. How do you get visibility into all the downstream risk? You know, it's not just our third parties that are outsourcing. It's also uh, the hackers they're outsourcing to other hackers. Um, the only way really to get a handle on third parties, and I, I think this goes back to what you said about the vendors that you had in your portfolio. Third party risk isn't limited to just technology vendors or IT service providers. There's so many more relationships inside of an organization that are uh, touching data, processing data, interacting with proprietary systems. And it's not just limited at that vendor level. You have suppliers that are doing that. You have what I like to call non-traditional third parties. So these are those marketing automation technologies, the digital brand agencies, um, law firms, any type of strategy consultants. They're all touching that data as well. So it's not, third party risk isn't just limited at that vendor uh, level. And, you know, one of the things that's becoming more and more challenging is that organizations will define uh, vendors just as those IT providers and focus all of their risk management efforts on that group, leaving an entire area of the organization exposed. Yeah, I mean, I remember in the early days, they're like, yeah, we're, you know, we, uh, you know, we're, we're managing IBM and they were managing their really big third party relationships. And I'm like, yeah, but that's probably not where your risk is. Those organizations are a little more mature. They probably have good security controls in place. They're probably doing a really good job with your data. You know, I, I would look at uh, loan servicers or loan um, uh, servicing bodies or we were outsourcing printing of statements for like mm -hmm. wealth management customers, right? These were mom and pop shops yeah. that may not have had the budgets for security controls, but yet you're sending them all this sensitive 
uh, information. Social security numbers were on these statements back then, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you think about all the potential risk areas. It's it's beyond some of your big tech companies. It's it's these little mom and pops that are providing a service for you. I mean, I absolutely uh, absolutely agree. And uh, you know, yet another hurdle for third party risk is that there is no single owner of third party risk. It's not like let's say regulatory compliance, where you know your compliance team. Is, uh, is on it and is managing it. When it comes to these third-party relationship, it's more of this coordinated effort. So you have your risk folks, your security folks, your procurement, and everybody touches this relationship at some stage, but no one says, yes, this is our responsibility. We're going to manage this process from beginning to end. It's just, it's like a hot potato and the responsibility keeps getting, you know, moved around until finally someone is it and has to, um, you know, attest to what's been going on. And that's, that's incredibly challenging. Um, certainly your point about spend is, is very well taken. You know, I think the risk there is more about value at risk and, from the research that we're doing, we see that a lot of companies are still looking at uh, their top tier vendors or their most critical vendors purely based on the size of the spend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and that's maybe not where the highest risk is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're spending a lot of money, but they may also have the budgets to do it. You know, one of the trends I did see for a little while, at least in the financials, because I did spend a lot of time in the financials with some of the larger banks, is that procurement was taking more of a centralized role in trying to coordinate the activities and in, in trying to take some level of ownership, right? You'd have the information security teams doing their technical checks. You'd have legal coming in, doing the contracts. Uh, but procurement was doing it in, in a lot of the financials. I, I guess we're not seeing that in other industries outside of the financials? I mean, we are. Procurement is certainly involved. But I think what we're seeing more often is that that true uh, risk assessment happens after the contract is already awarded. Mm -hmm. So procurement will do some sort of, you know, check, um, and then it goes off to legal and contracts. And, and now someone sends it to security or to a dedicated third party risk team and says, OK, we need to get this vendor onboarded. So can we just do like this thorough risk assessment? Because we think, you know, they need to be assessed. And at that point, what are you supposed to do? Right. I mean, the organization has already contracted this vendor. You've already committed to it. And you know, once you do that assessment, you might realize, goodness, you don't want them anywhere near your systems or your data. And so there's a, a, a huge missed opportunity there to do this type of thorough vetting and due diligence before the contract is awarded. So I think, you know, if risk and security can really coordinate with procurement to give them that information about the risk level, but do it you know, in time before that decision is made, I think that's really that sweet spot of opportunity where they can be much more proactive about managing risk. Yeah, I think that was a big challenge. The contract was already signed. What are you going to do now? Yeah. But if we think about where things are right now, as we think about the pandemic and we think about organizations kind of reassessing their suppliers or supply chains, maybe the third parties, is there not there should be an opportunity the question is are they taking advantage of the opportunity to actually do the risk assessment up front as they reevaluate their third parties in the supply chain because we're seeing a lot of impacts in that supply chain is this a really good opportunity for them to get in front of the risk concerns with these relationships you know, funny you should mention supply chain. I think I was, uh, I'm working on some research around uh, supply chain risk. And I think it was in April, the term uh, reshoring spiked in Google search because everyone said, oh my God, there's this pandemic and we see all of this disruption. If we just bring everything back, we'll be fine. And that just kind of fizzled out. But, you know, what's really happening at the supply chain level is that they don't understand where these relationships are. In other words, um, whether they have any type of concentration in a given country or geography, maybe it is a concentration of a specific um, 
supplier for a product line, if you will. I think what needs to happen before that type of assessment at the supply chain level is that you need to do a mapping to understand, okay, these are all of, let's say, the tier one suppliers or what we would consider third parties. And this is where they are. But now let's take it one step further and map from the third party to the fourth party and from the fourth to the fifth. Because as we know, you know, risk flows downstream. So something that might be impacting your fourth or fifth party eventually will if it's not mitigated, will come back and manifest itself in some sort of disruption at the third party level. So before we really think about that, um, that third party assessment, we're just going to assess our tier one suppliers, you need to get a handle and by doing that type of mapping. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and, and you also have to broaden your concept of risk a little bit here, too, because country risk, you mentioned it, plays a big part of this. Where is the concentration of these suppliers and where are they geographically? Are there risks associated with that relationship? What are the potential you know, credit or financial risks? I mm -hmm. If we see a specific area get into a credit crunch, does that have an impact? So risk has to expand a little broader than the way you know, we probably did it early on, which was we were just looking from a technology or security potential, but there are other risk factors here that also have to be evaluated. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and you hit the nail on the head. You know, insolvency of a supplier is a real risk. Uh, things like um, credit policy, uh, financial conditions, even trade policy, right? So if, you know, there is a country or region that's put on that type of watch, then that impacts all of the suppliers in that area. Then extend that to things like natural disasters. So where was that hurricane? Where was that earthquake? Was there some other type of climate risk event that may have impacted an entire region? Um, business continuity. You know, we're good about, or we, we like to think we're really good about managing our own business continuity, but how often do we ask a supplier, not just whether or not they have a business continuity strategy, but ask to see what that plan looks like, to say, does it factor in for the same things that ours does? And if we do have a major um, disruptive event like a pandemic, do we know whether or not they're going to be able to uh, you know, maintain that comp uh, continuity? Is there resilience built into their operations? And so I think you're absolutely right. We need to start broadening the types of risks that could impact the operations of that third party. Yeah, and what that does, though, is it creates this really interesting complex matrix, I think, of not only understanding the third, fourth, fifth party risks, uh, relationships, but then all the risk factors associated with each of those. Are there any good vendors out there that are doing a good job to help people really visualize that relationship? Um, I, I know of a couple that are doing a really good job, I think, of understanding the interconnecti interconnectivity of the relationship, but it's more at the security risk level and not taking some of these other factors in. Are there some good solutions out there that are doing a good job, both on the relationship, but also the expansiveness of the risk that needs to be assessed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we see more vendors that are doing that type of supply chain mapping. So you're talking about that visual of where all of my third, fourth, fifth party relationships are. Um, we see vendors that are, uh, I, for lack of a better term, aggregating risks mm -hmm. and risk events, monitoring social media. So um, for example, I, I know of uh, several organizations that are using that type of event or social media monitoring that they got wind of there, you know, there were factories closing in Wuhan as far back as December of 2019. Um, so those are the types of technologies that you want to start uh, monitoring the different regions that you're at. Um, the cybersecurity ratings are terrific at helping you understand that security posture. You have financial ratings that will help you understand the financial viability, not just whether or not a uh, supplier or a vendor is, uh, has a, a, an insolvency risk, but also, okay, now that they've been hit by this pandemic, do they even have that financial um, wherewithal to be able to sustain 
sustain it, mm-hmm. or are we looking at them possibly folding in six to 12 months? So there are a lot of t- uh, technologies that have these individual specializations and can bring those pieces together. But ultimately, um, they need to be aggregated into a common dashboard or some sort of uh, platform that allow you to contextualize and assess those risks accordingly. So GRCs are good for that. We see um, a whole other category of just third-party risk management platforms that can do the visualization, can do the mapping, can um, look at you know their compliance levels, and also help predict areas of concern and how risks in one area might be impacting risks in another. Yeah, okay. So it's a combination. It's it's a uh, you know it's a coordination of of several tools together. Yeah, and making sure that all the stakeholders in the organization have access to that aggregated data, so that they can make valid decisions about whether that relationship should stay in place or they should look elsewhere. Yeah, you know you're you're spot on with that. I think the visualization of what you you know what am i looking at and what do i need to do with it if that varies from team to team if i'm in finance i want to understand where i should be spending or where i might need to spend if i'm in procurement i need to understand where i need to start sourcing or how i might want to diversify uh that network if i'm in compliance i need to understand if there are any you know, um, country specific regulations or industry specific regulations that now I need to start um, putting on my list to monitor for. So uh, having dashboards that are specific for the different business areas is going to be key because they need, you know, individualized uh, information to make their own decisions and to action on that. Yeah, they need the context that's appropriate for them versus just something that's so broad that they can't really understand the the context of the risk for for their specific uh, uh, organization or their specific uh, team, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, Allah, if people want to get some of the access to some of the Forrester research, where should they go? Yeah, uh, Forrester website has... Um, a lot of research. In fact, you know, we just put out a couple of major reports on the GRC market. So looking at the GRC platforms, actually, this is coincidental, but today uh, we just published a report looking at the third party risk technology space. So there's that that's available. Um, Certainly check out, you know, uh, any of my social media. So on LinkedIn, I, I will typically put links to anything that I publish on third-party risk or supply chain risk or GRC. So that's a great place to start. Great. Uh, Ala, thank you so much for joining us on Security Weekly. Thank you for having me. This has been terrific. Yes, a lot of fun. And stay tuned. We have, I think, one more interview left for today on Virtual Hacker Summer Camp.